Worlds, the Truth About series we've been doing. And this one here is the Truth About the Book of Revelations. There are seven keys to understanding the Book of Revelations. Seven keys. And most people today will, will say some, something like this. Maybe you've heard it. They say, well, you know, I leave the book of Revelation alone because it's just full of all kinds of things I don't understand. Well, the Bible says that that's wrong. The Bible says God wants you to understand the book of Revelation. It's not a mysterious book. In fact, with these seven keys that I give you, you will never have another problem with the book of Revelation because it was written for you to understand. In fact, the Bible says that there is a great blessing to those that just read it and hold it dear to their heart. Well, just like the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. The word Genesis means beginnings. The book of Revelation is the endings. So you should believe the whole book from Genesis to Revelation. Can you say amen? So these seven keys are very important. We're just going to have a good time. So we just want to say good morning to you, church. Amen. This briefing is on how to understand the book of Revelation. Other people would say, well, I leave that book alone because it kind of scares me. But how many know that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind? And that, I just want to say this. Uh, I was trained by a very good pastor who had all the end time stuff down. He didn't get off in squirrely prophecies. He didn't get off in things that didn't match up with the word of God. But instead, he broke down the word of God and the timelines of it. And he was very inept at teaching the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation really has a lot of little understandings. There's symbols in it. There's types and shadows in it. But the book of Revelation is not about tribulation. It's not about curses. It's not about vials. It's not about demons. It's not about angels. It's not about all those things. It's about something else that is sort of missing sometimes people's understanding. Are you with me? The scripture is clear when it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And here we see this marvelous book about to be opened to you and are you ready to receive from it? Now this book was written by the Spirit. So therefore, as a Christian studies this book, we have to get from our outer man into our spiritual man, and we need to have the Holy Spirit open the eyes of our understanding. Can you say amen? But without these seven keys, you're going to get things all messed up. When, why, how, what's happening here, what's the earthly story, what's the, uh, what's the heavenly story, what are the informational chapters, what are we going to do about all this? Actually, the book is really not that hard. Jesus says the gospel, even a child can understand. What makes this book hard is our intellectualism. Us willing to take some of the things that we think are the truth and match them up with what it says in there. Remember, the key to all Bible interpretation, say Bible interpretation, is Bible. The best way to interpret Bible is with Bible. God does not take and use phrases he doesn't repeat over and over again. He has certain things and that mean certain things. And if there's a C in there, and if it has a name, that's the C. Can you say amen? And if it says a sea of people, then you know it's a big crowd of people. So there's a lot of simple phraseologies in here that we make hard through our intellectualism. How many know the Bible says, lean not to your own but rather trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge God throughout the day. Say hi to him. Talk with him. Interject yourself with him. Why? Because then he can direct your path. You know, stuck in yourself sitting as a mugwomp somewhere. Amen. All right. So remember, this is not just about tribulation. This is about one major theme, this book. 
Just like all the themes, there's one major person that is highlighted through every book of the Bible. Can you tell me who this person might be? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So what is the name of our fellowship? Christ-centered ministries in these last days. I'll tell you, the Christians that are going to have successful walks are the ones that are focused on Jesus, listening to the Holy Spirit, and making sure they're not become an offense to the gospel. Are you with me? Go with me to Matthew chapter 13, please. Let's get into this. Man, I'm excited to share this with you. It's not hard. It's a book that has seven understandable keys that you need to apply throughout scripture. Matthew chapter 13, 10 through 14. Now I'm going to say something so you understand because this is a short lesson today because we want to get out there and enjoy some of the sun. But these things I want to understand. Say parable with me. Now, I was sharing with one of my sisters uh, Friday when I came in. We had all that marvelous food that Joe prepared, and I was just so good. And I was sharing with her that a lot of times we, we want to share the Bible with somebody, but Jesus shared Scripture, but then he had a story, a parable that came along the side that emphasized the story. Now, here's the key. The religious people of the day, remember they used their intellect. They missed God entirely. They preached the law instead of preaching the promises of Abraham. And so Jesus began to relate because the Jewish people rejected him. He began to relate to the people, the Gentiles, with the scripture and then with a parable that go along with it. So what I was saying to my sister yesterday, I mean the day before yesterday, was that always when you're sharing the word with your children, think of a story that goes along with it that proves the point. And so this is what this is about. And the disciples came to him and, and why do you speak to them in stories, in parables? And he answered this to them because I, it has been given to you. Everyone meet, say me. It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. You don't cast pearl before swine. Hello? You don't. They didn't understand God the way they were supposed to. We have to serve God from our heart, not our head. Amen. And so he talked to them about their heart. He talked to them and threw down stories. And so he says, no, you should know the mysteries. <clears throat> Excuse me. Singing all that time and preaching all this time. I love it. So, then it goes on. Then it says, for whoever has to him more will be given. What do you suppose he's saying? Have What? Well, they didn't have Jesus back then, so he's saying something else. Well, faith would kind of work. Here's what he's saying. He that pays attention will get more. He that's got his mind thinking on burgers and shrimp afterwards is not going to get a thing. <laughs> Do you understand? So let's put that in there. I mean, it has a lot more meaning than that. But whosoever has the ability to listen and pay attention, it will be given. And he will have more abundance. But whoever doesn't pay attention, who doesn't listen, even what he has will be taken away from him. Now, who's the thief in the Bible? Who's the one that takes away from you? Well, God received your, your sin, but that's not what I'm saying. Satan steals from you. So say this with me. Every time I'm in the flesh... The thief comes by to steal. Say it again. Every time in the, I'm in the flesh, the thief might stop by to steal. So get out of the flesh, flesh. So basically, that's it. The gospel is really simple. There's the old Jew. Stay away from him. Because he's been programmed or she's been programmed to listen to the devil. To be selfish. And there's the new you who's been programmed and being programmed to listen to God. And so when we listen to God, he gives us the wisdom to study a book like the book of Revelations. 
<clears throat> Hope I'm not making you thirsty doing that. Anyway, so let's look at this. And he says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, stories, because seeing they don't see. Why? Didn't they see Jesus as a threat instead of a Messiah? Didn't the religious people see Jesus as a threat? Yes. Come on, look at me. Yes. yes, religious people always hate Christians. Why? Because it threatens them. Somebody that's happy and boisterous and excited and so focused into other things of God that they can't pay attention to themselves or other things that are going around them. Wow, oh my gosh, what a pain in the rear end for the devil. A Christian that loves Jesus so much. See, that's me. Amen. How does Satan know when to attack you? You better put a smile on your face because that's one of the ways he checks you. He'll come by and say, who's smiling, who's not? Who's smiling, who's not? Oh, good, I'll land on that dude. Hello? I'll lay some doo-doo in his head. All right, or her head, or whatever. Okay, you with me? A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, to understand Scripture, we must apply our spirit, not our intellect. Scripture is spiritually revealed. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Huh? For reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Second Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when we do Revelation, we're going to show you how to rightly divide it. How many know there's a, there's a timeline before the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a timeline after the de death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Goes right up to the rapture of the church. Then ushers in seven years of tribulation. Right after the seven years of tribulation, Jesus comes back, second coming. He sets up a millennial reign. And all of that is within the scripture of the book of Revelation. But it's still not about that. It's about something else. Are you with me? So to understand scripture, we must apply our spirit. That's why you pray a little before you sit down and you read your Bible. Two, the book of Revelation is no different. It has a historical setting. It has meaning. It has keys that reveal to us by the spirit how it is interpreted. Let me ask you this question. Who was there showing John these things in the book of Revelation? The Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, thirdly, God the Father, by via the Holy Spirit, opens our eyes that we can see what God means when he lays the book out before us. Everyone say amen. amen. And let me give you this scripture. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 10 through 12. Always write your address down first and then try to look it up later. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. See, it has to be by the spirit. And the spirit resists what? Resists the proud. Where's your pride? Your pride's in the flesh, isn't it? So whenever you're a Christian, you're in church and you're in the flesh, are you going to get anything from the word? Not a thing. You probably get mad at me. Because you think I'm, I'm reading your mail. Or I'm picking on you. See, that's what the flesh, that's how the flesh operates. You know, a lot of times people ask me the question, why do you take a little bit of time and give us a historical setting and set us up? Why? Because some scripture, if you just read it and you don't understand the testament it's in, the historical setting that it's in, you won't understand it all. But a lot of times people get all caught up and lose everything because they have their own opinion of the word rather than letting the word change their opinion. Say, oh me, someone. So God the Father by the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, but it has to be by the Spirit. First Corinthians again says, but God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of man that's in him? 
Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. 12 says, now, we have received not the Spirit of the world. Someone say, amen. amen. But the Spirit which is from God. See, what are you feeding? What are you listening to? That we might know. Everyone say, no. See, God wants you to know that you might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Do you know them all? Do you know how to appropriate the promises? Do you know how to start, maybe you started off with a bad day, do you know how to change that? Do you know how to turn from unhappy to happy in an instant of time? You should know all of these things because guess what, one day you might, you might be by yourself. There's no preacher like Carrie here to remind you that what you need to be doing. We all get formulated and we think we go, no, and everything. Listen, do the word. Do the word. Feel good? Do the word. Feel bad? Do the word. Feel happy? Do the word. Feel sad? Do what? The word. Absolutely. You can't get away from it because it's what you do that makes you. It's not what you think about. Amen. All right. So we got that part. Now the revelation of Jesus Christ. First of all, the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what that book is about. It's about Jesus Christ, how he handles the end times. Do you understand me? How he becomes the judge, how he becomes the, the king of kings and lord of lords. So let's read Revelations chapter 1, 1 through 4. Now, a couple of things I want to set you up on. Now, whether you believe this or not, doesn't really matter because this is the truth. The church of Jesus Christ, we belong to the church, don't we? Is the church this building? No, this is just the house of God. The church are, are you. You are the church of God. Yeah. Believers all over the world are the church of God. Can you say amen? amen. Now, so what you're going to find out is after chapter 4, it says that the heavens were open and John hears a voice and says, come up. That is a type and shadow of the rapture of the church. Because after chapter 4, listen to me, check it out yourself, don't just believe me. You'll see no longer the church mentioned through the rest of the chapters. Why? Because we're gone. We're before the truth. You know, I, I believe that God always rescues the righteous away from the wicked before judgment falls. Can you say amen? And he's so wonderfully good at it, he could separate anybody from anything. You just got to trust him. He's so good at your situation, there's no problem you can go through that he can't handle. The problem is, is you're still handling it and he has to wait till you let go. I don't know why I said that, but somebody needed to hear it. Now, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the book about? First key is it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Not tribulation. Not demons, huh? not mid-trib, post-trib, in-trib. You know what I mean? Yes. It's about Jesus Christ, how Jesus handles himself through these seven years and towards the ending. Can you say amen? amen. It gives us a different picture of Jesus. So I'm going to give them to you in just a minute. Let me read. <coughs> and it says, A revelation of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave to him, to show his servants. You see what he said? God the Father gave this picture of Jesus Christ to Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is going to appear in the third most glorious picture. Why? Well, when he came into the earth, he came as a lamb. As he grew up, he became a shepherd. And then later on, when he went to the cross, he became a sacrifice. But the third and mightiest picture of all is that towards the end when he comes as king of kings. 
and Lord of Lords. So if you don't understand the book of Revelation being and centered around Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you're going to misunderstand the book. First key. Everything revolves around in the earth, according to the Father, around whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. Everything revolves around the Lord Jesus Christ. And our lives, they should revolve around. Come on, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Not your activities, not your opinions. And we get in caught up with that. Okay, now watch. Okay, so they show to his servants the things which must shortly take place. And he sent it and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words. Remember paying attention, listening, Hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. So let's go ahead and let's look of the seven keys. All right. Now we found out, I let it out, I let it out of the bag. The first key, okay, is it's a book about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the apocalypse is Jesus Christ being revealed. Hello. Remember, Jesus had left them. He had left after he rose from the dead. He left and he says, I'm going to send you. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Right? And so they were without seeing, touching, you know, watching Jesus all that time. What were they thinking? They had to follow God now by faith. And they're going to go through all of these different things at times of the Gentiles. And then all of a sudden we're going to be caught up. Jesus is going to stand in the clouds and he says, children, come on home. As we go up with the glory of God, Satan is going to fall out of the heavenlies, out of the prince of power of the air, and is going to fall to the ground. It says, woe be to the nations, for the, for the prince of this world has come to the nations. Then tribulation is going to be launched. Now, I know that's a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm, this is one of my expertise. I can get lost in details here, but I don't want to do this for you. So what is the first key I understand in the book of Revelations? It's a revelation of whom? As king of kings and lord of lords. All right. Once you understand these keys, you will see how the book comes together. There's a real blessing to those that read it, retain it, and study those words in their heart. For the time is at hand, it says. So let's look at these keys. First one we know is Jesus Christ. So let me express. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Just write that down. It's not in my notes, but write it down. It says, you and I with an open face, as beholding in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being changed into that same image. From glory to glory. So, if we don't have an image of Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord and Lord, this book will help you have an image of what it's like when the whole thing is done and we win. Go ahead. That's why the little stuff that you and I go through, like legs and all this, is but a vapor. The main thing is getting to know God and hanging out with a man. Can you see Amen. So, not only it says we behold and we're to look at Jesus' face, but do you remember when Jesus was transformed? He took Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain, and he, and he, he went about a stone cast away. You know the story, don't you? And so he, he was transformed, it says. He was talking to his father, and the glory of God came down and transformed even his clothing. 
a little taste of what it's going to be like when you and I go up. Right? And then as he's talking to the father, Elijah shows up and Moses shows up. Most people don't understand the significance because the Jewish people that were so hopelessly lost, weren't they given the prophets? Weren't they given the law? That should have pointed them to Jesus, shouldn't it? But no, the father had to interrupt here. And so cursed Peter. Oh, it's good that we be here. Oh, let's make three tabernacles. Blah, 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 blah. Just like people, hey, I, I read this and I did this. And now I'm ready to challenge the world. And a week later, you just beat to a pulp because you're not a doer of the word. You're just a reader of it. Yeah. Careful of it, okay? And so they're looking. And suddenly this cloud overpassed them. And God speaks up. And what does he say? This is Jesus. Listen to him. So what were the Jews doing? They were looking towards the prophets. What's the church doing right now? All the squirrely parts of the churches are all looking for a prophet and a word from the Lord. There's a more sure word from the Lord. It's called the Bible. Book of Revelation is a good one. Now I know I'm hamming it up a little bit. I want to tell you, there's a lot of people they're just floating around. There's no basis. They're going on feel goodness. And because I can do a couple of good things for the Lord, that's being spiritual. No. First of all, focus on Jesus. So God answers, says, no, this is my beloved son. Hear him. In other words, when in this last day, you need to focus on whom? Jesus. Who, what's the book of Revelation about? That's right. So you get to read in the book of Revelation, you do it with your intellect, now you're going to be in, in the vials and plagues and what's this going to be and what's that going to be? You miss the whole point. First point, it's about Jesus. It's about our victory. It's about preparing us for seven years to come back with him and to train. Are you excited? Okay. Amen. So the second, the second key Say so second, second key is to reveal this king of king to his servants. Hello? What do you mean? Well, the servants, a lot of them were weary. What is the, old, the New Testament? When you read the books of the New Testament, did you happen to notice something? Every book of the New Testament deals with the condition of the church relating to God, right? Doesn't matter which book it is, Galatians, Romans, doesn't matter. About problems within the church and how to relate to God, right? Right? Somehow we read that and we just apply it to somebody else. You got to read the word and apply it to yourself. And if you're not lining up, ask God to help you. So, the revelation of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the end of the book and the total victory is to be revealed the second key to his servants. And guess who you and I are? So what are we getting revealed to? The second key, Jesus Christ. Who's the Lord of your life? Who's the sum total of your joy? Who's the Godhead in you bodily? Who is the lily of the valley? Who's the bright morning star? Who's the first and the last? So why are you focused on too many other things? Interesting, huh? Okay, second key, to reveal this part of Jesus to his servants. Third key is there's a great blessing to those who read the book, even if they don't understand it. Why? Because it's spiritually discerned. So you can be reading along, and if you once you know these keys, you'll be able to relate it to what time period, and remembering all these things that they're going through during the tribulation. Remember this above everything. Everyone say, okay, you're not going to be here. Amen. When you get to reading this book, you're not going to be here. After chapter four, you're gone. Amen. But people get all goofy in the way they reason things out. They don't keep things in perspective. Okay. Amen. 
There are seven dispensations written in scripture. They're all segments of time in which God deals with mankind differently. Same God, but he deals with man differently. In the beginning was the t dispensation of innocence. That was before sin. And then when Adam and Eve sinned, it became the dispensation of conscience. Now they're trying to follow God by their conscience. <clears throat> Here's something you might not know. People got so far away from God back then that they only began to call on God in Genesis chapter 4. So all that time from Genesis 1 all the way through, they didn't call on God again till Genesis chapter 4. Shows you how Satan works hard on people that know not God. So there's a great blessing for us to hold fast to these words. Okay? All right. Okay, now we're going to move into the most important keys. Everyone say most important. There's seven all together, so we got three. A revelation of who? Jesus Christ, King of Kings. And revealed to us. And then third, a blessing to those who read and retain this book, a prophecy. Can you say amen? The fourth one is you got to understand the chapters of the book. Which one's dealing with the heavenly story? When you're reading around the book of Revelations and now they're all around the throne. That would be a heavenly story, wouldn't it? And then when all the plagues are operating in the earth, that would be the next key. The chapters that deal with the earthly story. And if you get the heavenly mixed with the earthly and the earthly mixed with the heavenly, you're just going to get it all messed up. Remember, we're not going to be there. Amen. You'll be observing, yeah. but you won't be there. Yes. So you shouldn't be storing up food and preparing for tribulation. Amen. You should be preparing for coming. And God taking you away. Yes. Blessed are those that are waiting and watching for my coming, he says in the book yes. of the Gospels. So the next one is there's a heavenly story. Okay. That's the fourth one. The fifth one is there is an earthly story. What's happening on the earth? These are pretty simple keys, aren't they? So you're reading along. And there's plagues coming out of the Euphrates. Is that in heaven or is that on earth? You see, these are not hard. What makes them hard is you trying to spiritual. We we try to spiritualize everything. Ooh, I got a heavy ribby. I got a heavy ribby. No, you got a bunch of boo 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 boo. Is what you got. <laughs> try to say that. That's almost tongues. Hoo boo boo boo. Okay, here we go. So there's a heavenly story. Four, an earthly story. Five, the sixth key is what we call, everyone ready? Informational chapters. They're chapters that just give you information of what these things are. What is this? And what is this? What is the plagues? What are the bulls, the vials? What are the trumpets? They're informational chapters. They're not going about heaven. They're not necessarily about earth. They're giving you things to reference as information. And it all wraps around who? Jesus Christ. Now, you think you can handle that book now? Most assuredly you can. Just don't be in a hurry. And be careful who you listen to. Because I want to tell you, I love to talk to some of these people that says they got a handle on this and they got a handle on that. I love to sit down with them. I always notice they avoid me. They run from me. Because I'll show them what's right and what's not. And they don't appreciate that. People sometimes, remember what, 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 what Paul said? He said, he said uh, when I leave, I'm afraid that you're going to let wolves come in and you're going to let people rise up on the inside of you and teach you things that are crazy. Take a look nowadays. Is there some crazy teaching out there or what? Stay with the Bible. Okay. So we got how many keys so far? Six. Did you get them all written so far? 
All right, the last key. See the last key? Bless your hearts, you guys. I love you. The last key is there's a past, present, and future tense in the book of Revelation. What deals with the past? What deals with the present? And what deals with the future? Tribulation. Future? Yeah. You're not in the tribulation now, yet some Christians say we are. You're not in the tribulation now. Well, we got this big problem. Oh, this is just the beginning of sorrows. I've been warning Christians for 40 some odd years. This time was coming. My pastor before that. Why? Because the church is supposed to be looking for his coming. Not playing church. Hello? I don't want you coming up and worshiping the band if you don't know how to worship the Lord at home. It's just not going to score good. Can you say amen? God, remember little David? Shepherd David? As he was with the sheep, he grew up, didn't he? And you know what he did on his off time when he's sitting in the doorway? He's singing to God. Singing to the sheep. Singing and making melody in my heart. Making melody in my heart. I'm making melody in my heart. Unto the king of kings. Right? And so he learned all about relating to God as he was a little shepherd boy. And God began to pour into him because Jesus was his focus. Pouring into him. No wonder God says he's a man after my own heart. Doesn't mean he didn't make mistakes. But kept getting up and going after God. Listen, the worst thing you can do is if you had a bad rough time, don't get up in front of the congregation and tell everybody you repent and you're going to be a good boy or a good girl. Don't do that. Satan will make a mockery out of you. First of all, your job is not to repent in front of others. That's when you first came to Jesus. Repentance is not something you do anymore. What you do is you relate on a daily basis to God. You shouldn't be bad enough as a Christian to repent. We should be open and honest and say, God, I need you. And go to him on a daily basis and then you won't be repenting. Now, I said that because we happen to take religious Old Testament teachings and try to put them into the New Testament. They don't work. Okay? Don't run around, tell everybody how sorry you are. Now, I'm really going to dig here. Listen, we know you're sorry. That's why you have Jesus. When you make a mistake, don't point out everybody that you made a mistake. And don't run around saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're not a bubbling, bumbling idiot. Stand up and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your hope and I'll yes. make me humble. But don't stand out and bubble, bumble stuff. Come on, how does it look to you? If I got up there and, oh, I can't say, what would that, what kind of a visual would that give you? Not a very good one. How do people look at you? How are you coming across to others? You're supposed to be a witness. You're supposed to be an uplifter. Say amen, somebody. So the last key, you need to know what is past. So when God spoke to John about the seven churches, and he says in the days past, you need to do your first works over again. So you see some past in there. You see the Spirit of God's telling John that they need to change. Can you say amen? He said, you do these good things, but this is what you need to do. Return to your first love. Okay? So that would be a past thing, wouldn't it? What would be a present thing? And I, John, heard a voice. Ping, present. And then, when he comes, he said, and to show me things that are about to come to pass would be what? Future. Hello? Say, I got it. All right, because I'm going to come around during the time. And test you on these seven points. No, I'm not. I guarantee Satan will, though. He's always testing you. So guess what? Don't be drawn away of your own desires. But rather be focused in God. Did you get something out of that? How many here learned something new? 
Good. I'm glad you tuned in. Remember those seven keys? The book will just come alive to you. And you got to realize you're not going to be there. Amen. All right. Father, keep them.